Hello, this is the prologue to Romeo and Juliet, Act 1. And it begins with the chorus, which would be an actor coming out and saying these famous lines. Two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona where we lay our scene, from ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life, whose misadventured piteous overthrows doth with their death bury their parents' strife. The fearful passage of their death-marked love and the continuance of their parents' rage, which but their children's end naught could remove, is now the two-hour traffic of our stage, the which, if you with patient ears attend, what here shall miss, our toil shall strive to mend. Okay, so we have um, two households. And what do we mean by households? We mean families. This, the heart of this play has to do with two families. Both alike in dignity means that they're of the same social rank or same status in society. It's not that one is rich and one is poor. In this case, dignity implies that they are both upper class families, noble families. They should be leaders in their community. In Fair Verona, where we lay our scene, is a setting. We're in Verona, Italy, and it's the 1300s. From ancient grudge break to new mutiny, we have an ancient grudge. A grudge is a hatred, a resentment, a feud, and it's ancient. It's been going on for a long, long time. Maybe the people who are involved in this grudge don't even remember how the disagreement started, how the hatred between the two families started, but it's been perpetuated over the years. And it seems like maybe there was a time of peace or tranquility, and now all of a sudden things have exploded. There's a new mutiny, new riots, new violence, new killing. And that's where we are at the beginning of this play. Where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. Beautiful imagery, strong, poignant. You have the image that Shakespeare has used before and will use again of blood on the hands. And why is that significant here? Because they're not fighting the enemy from another country or another state or another city. They're fighting their neighbors, people that they would pass every day, people who are across the fence or across the wall. Those are the people that they're killing. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. Um, it's important to read, not just to the end of the line, but to the end of the punctuation, so that you can get the full thought that the um, poet is trying to convey. So when we look at the line that says, from forth the fatal loins of these two foes, we have from, forth, fatal and foes. It really sticks in the ear. It's supposed to be memorable and that is called alliteration, the repetition of the F sounds in this line. Um, what are loins? Well, loins deal with your reproductive region, your private parts. Um, and the whole idea of fatal loins, instead of these families giving birth to something beautiful, something wonderful, they're giving birth to something deadly, something that's doomed. A pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. You have the pair, being Romeo and Juliet, that they're star-crossed. The Elizabethans would have recognized this to mean that their destiny was written in the stars, their their meeting was written in the stars, but when it was crossed, that meant that it was doomed. It was um, twisted, broken, um, 
somehow tainted so that they are faded but they're ill faded their love is not going to come to any good how do we know that by the time we get to the end of this line what have they done they take their life and as one um, person said instead of take their lives it's take their life because the two people are so suited for each other that it's as though the two have become one but it's doomed it's not going to work out whose misadventured piteous overthrows doth with their death bury their parents strife this misadventure this is the course of their love is a misadventure it's exciting but it's not going to be good and it is the thing that the only thing that overturns the strife between their parents is their death so the only thing that stops their parents from fighting is their death and it's um ironic that the word doth with their death bury their parents strife the fact that Shakespeare uses the word bury here which is a double death the fearful passage of their death marked love well if your love is marked for um, mark, death marked it's not good that means it's doomed and we come back to the whole idea of being ill fated they are doomed and the continuance of their parents rage which but their children's end not could remove is now the two hour tra traffic of our stage so the um, speaker has basically repeated what he told us in the previous lines but tells us now that the events that lead up to the death of Romeo and Juliet are going to be the subject of this play and that the play is going to take two hours now you have to remember that um, these plays were performed not just for the rich and the well-to-do but they were also performed for the common people people who couldn't even afford to buy a seat would be able to stand in a mass in front of the stage and he, the speaker here is letting them know this play is going to be about two hours and he wants them to be what he wants them to be patient he says the which if you with patient ears attend if you listen carefully what here shall miss what you missed in this introduction our toil shall strive to mend meaning that um, their work toil here means their labor their work which is their acting shall make up for anything that was missed previously in this introduction before I close I want you to take a look at this poem because it's not a free verse poem it has two four six eight ten twelve fourteen lines and we know that a fourteen line poem is called a sonnet and a sonnet has a fixed rhyme scheme um, and if we look at it here we see dignity and mutiny rhyme scene and unclean rhyme foes and overthrows rhymes life and strife rhyme love and remove is a visual rhyme they're supposed to rhyme rage and stage rhyme and then the last two lines which are a couplet two lines that work together they rhyme and it's attend and mend so there is a rhyme scheme here it would be a b a b c d c d e f e f g g so these lines aren't just randomly put together the author is working within a form and he has to conform to that form in order to make the sonnet work so if you've ever tried to work make a sonnet it takes a lot of time and effort
Shakespeare was a master of sonnets. He wrote over 150 of them. Okay, so I hope this helps you um, with the introduction to the play. As we continue, you will have to find passages that you're going to explain um, and give your interpretation. Okay, thank you.